Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Microwave working, great. I'm Philippa Mansfield. I work for Natural England on catchment sensitive farming. And um, welcome today. This is the workshop on trees for air quality and farm business. I know it's a very hot, long day, so well done to make it this far. Um, I'm really lucky and happy to introduce to you our speakers to you today. Um, they'll be introducing themselves individually, but just to let you know, we'll be hearing from Elena van Gover from Forest Research. Um, she's going to um, talk about some of the tree measurements and soil measurements work we've done on the ammonia reduction from trees project. And then we're going to hear from David Brass from the Lakes Free Range Egg Company, come all the way down from Cumbria. And we're going to hear about his farm business and um, how he um, has introduced woodland to ranging areas for the, um, for the hens there. And Paul Arkell, who's um, also come down all the way from Cumbria. So thanks, Paul and David, for making that big effort. Um, and um, he's going to talk about the biodiversity on the woodland ranges and the practicalities of the tree planting because he advised David on the planting. So you'll yeah, hear a bit more about the farm business side afterwards. We're going to kind of start off with the um, trees and air quality side. So um, just to point out, there's a few leaflets on your chairs and uh, a poster there which we did the, with the Forestry Commission a few years ago, just to illustrate how you can use trees for different purposes, really, in the landscape and how they fit in as an integral part of the farm business. So it may be you're planting them for productive timber or wood fuel, or maybe across the slope to reduce runoff, which is good for water quality and flood risk. Um, but maybe some, something that we haven't really heard very much about so far, I think, is how you can also use trees to improve air quality. And that's what our focus is going to be today and how you can do that and where to put it and how to design it. Um, so why are we doing this? Well, there's been a big focus um, from government and a big push to improve air quality. Um, most air pollutants actually have reduced over the last 30 years, but one really stubborn one which hasn't gone down is ammonia. Um, and we've signed up to international targets to re reduce ammonia emissions by 16% by 2020, um, which is quite a challenging target, and it's something that um, other countries are, are aiming to do as well. It's a transboundary pollutant, so we don't own it. Some of our ammonia goes over to the continent and vice versa, and it comes... Um, mainly from farming, but also from a bit from traffic and industry. So the government set out the clean air strategy um, a few years ago, and the aim of that was to cut air pollution, um, to save lives and to protect the natural environment. And there was a whole chapter in there which was about reducing ammonia emissions from farming. Um, and it's all uh, mainly about things like manure application, slurry application, covering slurry stores, housing, um, and all those rules... Um, are going to be consulted on later this year and gradually be um, kind of brought in over time. But they've also introduced the Environment Improvement Plan, which has a whole range of goals with the apex goal of thriving plants and wildlife. And it's also got goals for clean air, clean water, um, natural, reducing nat nat natural hazards. Um, and they've said as part of that, everything is interlinked, essentially. So you can't um, achieve the biodiversity decline without addressing ammonia emissions because it's having such an impact on um, the natural environment. So these are the types of impacts that ammonia has. So first of all, human health. Um, so ammonia, it's a gas, NH3, nitrogen and hydrogen. It can get transported and it's a very reactive gas. It reacts with other pollutants in the atmosphere and it can form these very fine particulates which um, can cause um, heart and lung problems, low birth rates, higher death rates. So, and it's, it's linked into um, traffic pollution as well. So 
Um, some of the studies that have been done have shown that 40 to 60 percent of the particulates in urban areas actually are derived from ammonia, which means they're likely to have come from rural areas. So it's all interlinked. Um, and ammonia also affects the natural environment. So lichens and mosses are particularly sensitive um, to very low concentrations of, of ammonia, so um, one microgram per meter cube, so that's a tiny amount. Um, and so bogs and heath and habitats, for example, are sensitive because of that, um, and that reduces the capacity of those habitats to store water in the uplands, for example, and to store carbon, because those are important functions of those habitats. Um, also, ammonia can be deposited dry or wet um, as rain, and that causes enrichment. So it's nitrogen, essentially. So um, that means that you can smother out some species and reduce biodiversity, and it can cause acidification. So those are all the reasons why we're looking at ammonia. And um, Plant Life have actually said that the impacts of nitrogen deposition, which includes nitrous oxides as well from other sources, um, is much more immediate than climate change in terms of the impact on plant life. And it can also affect woodlands. Um, so ammonia and nitrogen deposition, according to the Woodland Trust, uh, is one of the greatest threats to ancient woodland, and um, particularly if you think about the characteristic ground flora um, of ancient woodland, can get outcompeted and replaced by more nitrogen-tolerant species. And then lichens can be an integral part of ancient woodlands as well and woodland funding, so those are sensitive to um, ammonia. So where's it all coming from? Um, well, 87% of ammonia emissions come from farming, so I'm afraid it's very much in the frame for where we go to see where we can reduce um, ammonia emissions, particularly dairy and beef sectors, um, and then pig and poultry, and a bit a lesser amounts from other livestock. And if you look at the farm as a whole, uh, the biggest proportion is coming from um, housing, so livestock housing, and then followed by uh, slurry application, fertiliser application, and then um, manure storage, hard standings, and small amounts from sewage and digestate application, although those bits are increasing with more digestate use. So those, that's where we need to focus. And one of the solutions that we have... Um, it's not reducing the ammonia emissions, but capturing ammonia emissions from farming for, by using trees. Um, and this is what we looked at in the field experiments that we carried out in 2020 up in Cumbria and then later in Shropshire, um, where we collaborated with um, David Brass here with the uh, Lakes Free Range Eggs and Paul and Elena from Forest Research and UKCH, who can't be here today, were leading the research in the field on this. So we, there, was quite a, there was some evidence in wind tunnels and some modelling of the effects, but there wasn't much field research done. So we wanted to know really how effective were um, some of the woodlands that are out there on farms at capturing ammonia. So we looked at um, five farms. So four of those were poultry. One was uh, poultry and dairy, and one was a dairy um, farm. That, so all the poultry farms had ranging woodland areas, and the dairy farm had a mature woodland. Um, and then we followed that up with a um, field trial in Shropshire, which had a narrow tree shelter belt, and that was on a broiler farm. And we did some surveys of farmers. And the, the aim was really to um, see whether there's enough evidence to get this into a grant scheme um, and provide advice to farmers on it, and also to develop the, the guidance and tools to... to um, tell farmers how to do this. So this is what's happening. This is a kind of diagram which Sim, who was working on the project with us, developed, which kind of shows you where the ammonia comes. So you get a plume of ammonia coming out of a, a chicken shed. Even free-range chickens go in at night. Um, and then there's some um, high levels of ammonia produced. But as they pass through a kind of a tree shelter belt or a kind of small block of woodland, the concentration of that ammonia will reduce um, and, the, and it will start to disperse out and you'll start to get mixing within the trees. Um, and if you have a protected site just beyond your woodland, what you're aiming to do is essentially get the concentrations down low enough by the time it gets to the protected sites that it's not going to be um, damaged by the ammonia levels. 
And ammonia is a very sticky substance, so uh, as I said, it's very reactive. So if you've got wet surfaces like leaves, then it will stick readily to it, and it's also taken up through the stomata. So this is just an example of one of the field monitoring trials that we did. Um, so this was a, a free-range unit um, with the ranging area all around in a U-shape, which actually is a perfect shape for um, trying to capture ammonia emissions, depending on what, what, where the wind comes from. Um, and we put monitoring points all around um, the shed in sort of transects going through, and um, so we 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 left them. You leave them out there for two weeks and then change them. So you have period, lots of periods of of monitoring the ammonia emissions, and what you can see is the ammonia um, levels are, are higher where they're closer to the shed than further away. And this particular site, it had a gap in the trees. Um, if you see between four and five there, which is um, so we were able to compare. Oh, what. Well, You'd expect to um, get a dilution effect anyway if there was just grass, but actually, are you getting a bigger effect if you've got trees than if you just had grassland there? So we were able to compare a sort of grassland ride with a woodland area. And what we found is that in, in an open area of grass, um, the ammonia levels did decrease by 40% over 35 metres away from the shed. But if you had trees there, they reduce by um, just under 60%. That's 35 metres of trees. And when the wind came from the other direction and went through 50 metres of trees, you got a reduction of about 74%. So some real field evidence for the, for the first time that um, the trees were reducing the concentrations more than just a grassland would. And this is the follow-up experiment in Shropshire. So this is some preliminary results from the Environment Agency. Roger Timmis has, has given me these to, to use and show to you. So they've got a special sampler called a directional passive air sampler, which basically rotates with wind direction. And the clever thing about that is that you can sample um, air coming from wherever the wind direction is blowing. So you can see what, what's the effect of, um, of the wind when it comes from direction of the sheds, and we had a sampler before and after the tree belt in this case, which is just a narrow belt of trees, only about 50 metres. We were interested in understanding, actually, is that going to be enough? Because a lot of people are saying, oh, what about agroforestry for ammonia? What about hedgerows? Um, we didn't really know whether you needed a woodland or whether you just needed a narrow shelter, shelter belt or a hedgerow or what. So this, this one is looking at that. And... Um, also, when it turns round, it's sampling air from the other direction, so air that's coming from the fields around or from a copse behind the, um, behind the sampler, behind the tree belt. Um, so we've had some quite interesting um, results from this, and what we've seen is that um, the concentrations behind the tree shelter belt were higher than the ones in front of the tree shelter belt, and... So we weren't quite sure why that might be, but it seemed to happen consistently. And then we kind of modelled it a bit, um, well, Rich did some modelling, and what he realised is the plume uh, of ammonia is coming at, because this particular shed has ridge fans, so ridge vents on the roof. So rather than um, David's sheds, which have natural ventilation from the eaves, uh, these are kind of shot up in the air. Um, so the plume of ammonia was overshooting the the trees and coming down on the other side and, and you had a higher concentration there, except where you had something like a feed bin in the, in the way and where that happened you had a kind of turbulence in the air and the um, plume was coming down earlier. So it, it makes, made, makes you realise that you've got to think about what, sh what type of livestock building are you talking about when you're, you're looking at your sh tree shelter belt and, and if it had been deeper then the plume would have been coming down within the woodland not not in the field, and whereabouts is your protected site that you're trying to protect. And the other interesting thing, when it comes from the other direction, from the field, um, he was able to measure the change in concentration, well, the change in flux, actually, which is related to concentration, and consistently found that um, there was a 20% change in flux going through 50 metres of trees. Um, 
that's when you've got a diffuse level of background ammonia emissions, which you would have anywhere like this in an agricultural area. Um, and that happened in the winter and in the, um, in the summer. So one thing that we wanted to do was to monitor all the way through to see actually what difference does it make when the trees haven't got leaves on. Um, but actually this, if you can see in the picture, it's, it's quite bushy, quite small pictures. It's quite bushy, copsy, kind of um, uh, narrow belt of, of trees. Um, so there's still quite a lot of surface area for it to get captured on. Um, and so I think what's, what makes me think is actually any trees in the landscape are probably good for air quality. Um, so we've used the results of the um, research to update some of the tools that UKCH hold on this Farm Trees for Air website. So this is a really good website if you want to go in and play around and try thinking about how you might design a tree shelter belt to maximise the capture of ammonia. So what you can do is you can put in, uh, put in your location. So this is just an example that you used on one of the um, experimental farms. Put in the location... Um, identify which species of trees are suitable for that location and try out different distances, um, um, so sizes of the main canopy and a backstop canopy for the tree shelter belt. And it will show you how much ammonia should be captured as the trees grow, because obviously the, more, the longer they grow, the bigger they get and the more effective they will be at capturing ammonia. Um, and you can compare, in this case we were comparing what, what would happen if you grew aspen in blue there compared with oak because aspen is much more faster growing than oak um, it will be taking up four times as much ammonia as oak after 15 years because it will have grown so much quicker but also you can see the effect of going from 20 meters wide tree shelter belt to a 50 meters wide one which is much more effective at uh, ammonia capture and the longer the trees are there the more they capture so Five to ten years, there's not much there, but after ten to fifteen years, and we found that in the um, some of the quite small trees in the in the ranging areas, they're already capturing some ammonia. So this is the kind of ideal design for ammonia capture, and I know there might be other, all sorts of purposes you might be growing trees for, but if you think of oh, what would I do to maximise how much ammonia is captured and how much is air is dispersed and diluted. What you would do is, is um, plant kind of wide spacing in the main canopy, which is wider than the livestock shed at the bottom there, and then have a backstop canopy at the back in a kind of U shape, um, which is much more tightly um, spaced, so one to two metres apart, and preferably have that as evergreen species so that the, tr the leaves are there all year round. So this is what we recommend as an ideal planting. And we've also added to that Farm Trees to Air website, we've added a mapping tool now. Um, so you can go onto, the, um, onto that website and you can put in your location or click on the map. And it will show you where the special sites of special scientific interests are and SACs, um, special areas of conservation. Um, and it will also come up with windrows. So on the right-hand side there, you can see a windrow. So you can work out where the prevailing winds are coming from newer locations. Sometimes they come with several predominant winds um, and it will give you a little diagram which shows you where's the best place to plant trees for ammonia capture. So basically you want to plant it downwind of the farm which is give or whatever it is that's giving off ammonia emissions. It might be a digestate store or whatever. Um, so obviously then you need to go and check uh, maybe with Natural England or Forestry Commission, whether it, uh, that is actually a good place to plant trees or whether there's any sensitivities um, there. But um, it will show you the best place for ammonia capture. And you can also see what are the protected areas around that you should be thinking about protecting. OK, now I'll hand over to Elena. Thank you, Thank you Philippa. So um, after Philippa explained about all the projects we looked at about how much trees can capture the ammonia, we wanted also to understand where that nitrogen goes to and um, where is it into, into the tree and does it go to the soil, how it's recycled, um, and whether it's leached, whether it's gone through the uh, 
uh, like a, a, as a greenhouse um, gas, um, and also whether there is any impact on the ecosystem, because um, as Philippa mentioned, nitrogen is a good thing for trees and for soils but uh, and for microbes, but up to what limit um, it is good, where we know that if the, 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 the system becomes naturally saturated, it could become uh, reverse, it could reverse it, its, its impact on the, on the wider environment and also on trees and soils um, uh, like health. Um, so, uh, I, as a forest researcher involved in this art project, uh, we were measuring, we went to the farms, the, the, the same farms where the ammonia has been measured, and we measured the trees, uh, different parameters of the trees, the, their growth, uh, as well as the uptake of uh, um, nitrogen and carbon. Uh, estimation, and we looked also at the soils with the help of uh, uh, now Kaiser and Kate. I want to acknowledge they are in the in the audience. Uh, they very recently brought uh, some soil data from this uh, uh, from one of the farms, but we're still to evaluate all the other farms. Um, and I'll show you a few uh, results from the um, Shelter Bell Stroke a Hedge uh, a Farm in, in Shropshire. Um, um, so what was our aims to look, as I said, where is the nitrogen to assess the canopy of the trees uh, to, through different parameters, physiological, uh, but as well uh, chemical parameters. Uh, we measure tree uh, diameters, tree height. Uh, we apply some allometric relationships to work up the biomass of the canopy. We also uh, sample tree leaves to look at their leaf area and estimate the proper leaf area index at the trees. So uh, just to explain, leaf area is very important about the surface of that canopy of the of the uh, uh, wideness and the biggest of this canopy and that uh, we believe that it relates to the abatement potential to the absorption and uh, uh, abatement potential uh, of trees so we measured very detailed the canopy of uh, all uh, different trees based on these farms we also looked at the soils and uh, we, we've looked at various chemical parameters, but particularly uh, we started with nitrogen, with acidity in the soil, and we looked at carbon, of course, and uh, some other very, very important nutrition, such as phosphorus, uh, calcium, magnesium, and potassium. And one very, a very interesting uh, thing we wanted to look is like how actually uh, this nitrogen could impact also the soil health in terms of soil biodiversity, and how that links to the soil functions. And uh, I'm not going to show you data on uh, on soil fungal communities and bacterial communities, which is just uh, uh, Katie is, is pulling together. Uh, but I could tell you that there are some very interesting results there as well. So the research questions were, what are the different tree species uh, and how, what is the different tree species capacity to capture and store um, uh, and recycle nitrogen? How this above ground nitrogen um, is actually compared to below ground nitrogen storage? So how much trees can absorb, but can soils also abate this nitrogen? Um, we also wanted to know whether nitrogen impacted on carbon. These are very, very direct links between nitrogen and carbon. We wanted to know whether the nitrogen impacted on carbon capture, uh, again, within the trees, but also within the soil. And the last but not least, which I'm not going to touch on, is what are the influence of nitrogen inputs on the soil biodiversity. Just a visual uh, kind of representation of how we sample. We sample very detailed the canopy. Uh, we sample the tree diameters and the height. Uh, we sampled all the four the cardinal directions of the canopy to understand also which side um, is more, uh, whether the side of, with the wind prevailing direction is uh, capturing more nitrogen than the others. And that was the case, I could tell you um, from now on, because I'm not going to present the four cardinal directions. And we sampled the soils, and um, we've analyzed all um, in the laboratory at Alice Holt, uh, which we got um, um, physical chemical laboratory. Uh, so um, this is uh, some of the, the results uh, to touch on. These are all the three species uh, put together from all the five farms in Cumbria. And um, there's the four parameters on the four graphs. One is the height on the, on the top left. Uh, then we've got the diameter down. And then the right um, uh, top is the, um, uh, the diameter. Then we've got leaf area index, which is the one at the bottom. And next to is the, is the canopy nitrogen uptake of these different tree species planted in the, in the shelter belts. Um, so you could see what we can say you know, straight away is that the fast growing tree species, uh, such as poplar, willow, you know, like ash, alder, birch, they are actually having much faster growth and they are having much higher leaf area and also they are taking much more nitrogen in their canopy. So this is really something which we could have expected. And we could calculate that. So for example, the tree canopy uptake of nitrogen ranged between the different species between 1.5 to 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. 
You could compare that with, for example, the nitrogen input through deposition, which is actually at the critical load. So a critical load for forestry is between 12 and 15, even 10 to 12 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare uh, as a deposition input. You could t say how much trees can actually take up nitrogen. They could take up to 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare if they're fast growing. And they will do it faster if they're fast growing, as, as um, Philip have mentioned. Uh, in, in her uh, slides. Um, and yeah, we could compare now the faster growing with the slower uh, growing trees in terms of how much they can take. Um, so yeah, the, the leaf area, if it's higher, the, the growth is higher, and uh, um, the nitrogen uptake is higher. The next thing we wanted to test is, is the uptake of trees higher where we think that the ammonia is higher near the near the farms and is it declining as we go further away as we've seen the same with ammonia which has been emitted from the actual housing and these are the graphs we've put it together the same with distance from the from the farms from the poultry sheds uh, away within the 120 150 meters to cover the same gradients of ammonia we've um, we've measured uh, as a gas and this is again the tree species height diameter, leaf area index, and a nitrogen uptake. And you could see very clearly that the trees near to the farm have been growing faster during that nitrogen uh, input. They were um, having higher leaf area and canopy growth, and they were taking much more nitrogen. So uh, this was very much likely. We haven't correlated directly with, uh, with the ammonia data, but uh, we got the same trends in ammonia as we go further away from the farm. So these trends are very much likely to be due to the higher nitrogen um, uh, input near the farm compared to uh, phasing out as we go uh, further. Looking at the soil, this is one of the uh, first results we got from when we look at the soil acidity. Uh, again, along the same gradient, uh, you can see very clearly in the black line with, uh, with um, well, it's a linear relationship, uh, away from the farm uh, with uh, the same gradients, that the acidity of the soil is improving as you move away, away from the farm. So one thing we could actually judge here and say that when we have high inputs to the edge of the woodland near to the farm, we've got uh, input either of ammonia as a gas to the canopy or ammo uh, ammonia um, becomes uh, uh, dissolved with rain and goes to the soil. So um, when it goes to the soil as ammonium, this, this um, uh, part of the nitrogen it gets nit nitrified uh, into nitrate. During this process, acidification happening. So we could, we could from, from only these results, we could say that they, they, there is high nitrogen cycling through the nitrification process within the soil closer to the farm compared to further away. And this is partly due to the higher end input, but also higher tree growth and higher root growth and cycling of nitrogen. And also microbial activity are higher due to the, uh, the, this input of nitrogen. Uh, one other thing I want to point out here is that we compared the soil acidity under the tree shelter belt compared to the to the soil acidity outside, uh, with you know near the farm, which is um, actually not planted. And you could see that in the red line. So the soil pH in the open area is much lower compared to the soil pH under the trees. And just say these trees are mostly broadleaf trees, and we know very well that broadleaf trees can buffer the acidity in the soil. So there are two very important results here uh, um, with the gradient uh, we've seen, but also the difference between planting trees and what trees of, uh, of, of this nature, and especially on a quite acidic soils to start with because of the ammonia input, uh, can benefit the soil um, uh, acidity. Well, improve, improve the, um, well, raise the soil alkalinity, let's put it this way. Uh, so as we know, soil acidity is very much linked to lots of activities, microbial activity, fungal activities in the soil, and the processes, uh, soil functions, are dependent on soil acidity. So um, I would not be surprised that lots of the other factors we are finding here are going to be dependent on soil pH uh, due to the nitrogen and nitrification. Uh, the next thing we look in the soil is carbon. We know that carbon and nitrogen are usually positively related. And that's exactly what we see here. So this is the soil organic carbon, again, in the first graph on, uh, on the left, uh, going from the farm towards um, along the gradient. And you could see that the soil car organic carbon is significantly declining as we, as we move away from the farm. 
Um, and the next graph is about the nitrogen. It's not significant relationship, but it's still you could see that it's going down in the same direction. So what 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 we can say that, um, for example, uh, first of all, total nitrogen was much um, higher under the trees than in the open area. This is another justification that the trees has actually taken that nitrogen from the air and input into the soil. I mean, it's not only this impact, there is, a, there is also a nitrogen fixer along these, these trees, but um, this is a very well phenomenon of, of obviously scavenging nitrogen and putting into the soil. So you could see that um, the, the nitrogen, for example, in the, under the trees is 5.8 tons per hect, uh, of nitrogen per hectare compared to open area seven to eight. Um, uh, um, Oh, the opposite, actually, sorry. So, yeah. So what we can say from this is that trees, planting trees as a shelter belt around these farms can aid significantly the uh, nitrogen capture, not only in the trees, but also in the soils. And this can aid carbon sequestration. You've got much higher growth to the, you know, in the, uh, we could see the carbon stock, for example, is uh, about 30 tons of carbon higher near the, um, the edge where you got uh, the, uh, the higher end input compared to um, uh, further away and also compared to the open land. Uh, just wanted to flag another important result we found about soil phosphorus. We all been uh, heard about other talks about talking. Obviously, agricultural settings are uh, usually related to higher phosphorus uh, inputs and also risks to leaching these inputs to uh, open water so, uh, or downstreams. And so, I think this is exactly very, uh, you know, very important result here to to see how trees, which are on the black line uh, along the shelter belt, have reduced in about uh, half, 50% uh, the soil uh, phosphorus in the, in the soil. Uh, so uh, this re is due to the uptake of the trees, due to the recycling and, and capture of uh, this phosphorus. And that's one of the positive things about trees, uh, planting trees on uh, agricultural um, settings, which could reduce the risk of phosphorus leaching and um, pollution. One last slide, just to show you the Shropshire farm um, results. Uh, at Shropshire farm, we, we've been looking as well, again, um, on a gradient uh, uh, transects away from the farm and measured uh, above ground barometers, trees, and soils. But this is just the soil results to suggest, again, how much more nitrogen you've got under the trees suggesting the capture. So all the green bars uh, is nitrogen, either as ammonia or nitrate in the soil under the trees. And all the blue bars are the, the, the nitrogen outside uh, um, in open area. Uh, again, this is you know five times to 10 times higher nitrogen in the soil um, due to the scavenging. And this, this hedge there has been for, for longer time than the uh, isn't it than the shelter belt? So this is more also a cumulative effect of the trees absorbing the nitrogen and uh, putting it into the trees, but also into the soil. So the next thing for us is to look at where from the soil this nitrogen goes. Uh, so um, uh, Kaiser uh, will be looking at uh, the uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, emission of the of the uh, from the soil. So where this NOx is, is going, we have already some of the first results, which are really much related to how much car, uh, nitrogen is in the soil. And uh, the next thing will be also to look at the leaching. You know, where is actually is there some soluble uh, nitrogen which goes out of this farm? Always all utilized within the fast-growing uh, trees. And up to what pine point it could be utilized effectively and helping uh, carbon to grow above and below ground, and at what point we might be able to think about uh, having a risk there. And these are the some take-home messages. Planting faster-growing species for shelter belts can be used to capture ammonia and store carbon earlier. Uh, trees with larger leaf area um, uh, capture more ammonia, and this depends on the species and the growth rate, of course. Um, planting broadleaf tree uh, benefits soil acidity improvement in shelter bales farm scenario, and with this we could say that it helps many other soil biological processes um, and also availability of, of nutrients. Um, and tree shelter bale shows a clear potential for nitrogen mitigation and higher carbon sequestration, both, both within the trees and the soil. So just want to say this is continuing. We are using these farms for 
measuring more below ground and above ground parameters as part of agroforestry projects, which just launched from DEFRA, um, which Alice is here, she's, and my, uh, Mike Purse, who are uh, with me, uh, we are leading on these projects. And uh, we're going to be asking, uh, well, maybe later, uh, if uh, people want to offer sites for agroforestry in addition to these farms for us to, to go and measure um, about the benefits and carbon um, and benefits uh, above and below ground of um, tree uh, in, in, in farms. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. <laughs> we have got David and Paul still coming to talk about the woodlands on their farm business. We, we thought we'd just pause for five minutes to see if there are any questions so far for Elena and myself. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, with just regards to tree planting, if there's any yeah. guidance besides just looking at um, uh, growth rates and leaf area, if there's any sort of index to sort of um, try to monitor, uh, well, for both deciding on what trees to plant if we're mm -hmm. uh, planting near farms, but also if we have planted trees, if we can s sort of measure the impact that's, that, that's going to have it for air quality in the future. And I know there's some metrics we can use that have been introduced recently to I3 Eco, and I don't know if, I don't know if that's, if you've been working with that, or if, um, if it, I know that's the PM 2.5 is included in that sort of assessment, but I don't know if it's specifically for ammonia. But we plant with, uh, with farmers frequently, so that okay. might be something that we want to look at trees and specifically like the best ones or, or how to measure the ammonia intake from specific species. So, yeah, the, a lot of the results that Elena um, got from that study were fed into the ammonia reduction calculator on the farm trees for air website. So there you can compare a whole range of different species to see how, how much ammonia they'll be capturing over their lifetime. Um, it has, that doesn't include PM 2.5, so yeah, we haven't done research on, although we know trees are good at capturing particulates as well, we haven't looked at that. I don't know if you have anything more on that. Yeah, I just just want to add that yeah, on the two first of all, um, if you, when you give the location, the location is linked to ESC, our ecological site classification system. I don't know whether you've heard of that too, but if you're not, Mike Perks from FR is going to do two stands t tomorrow, and I think ESC is on, on this. So what ESC does is actually um, uh, gives you the, the species suitability for uh, future climate, to, and, and particularly for the location you are on, uh, based on soil type, nutritional status, water status of the soil. So you've got a list of three species suitable to grow on this location to start with. So that was the first part of the module, of the tool. The next part, which we were populating with uh, all this data, it was the modeling about uh, um, which CH is MODUS model. They use uh, MODUS model, which actually uh, um, is a very detailed model about uh, the exchange of ammonia within the canopy of the trees, which is being populated by tunnel um, kind of uh, uh, manipulated experiments. But we now uh, are populating um, which trees, which, which leaf area index, and how that changes through the season. And, and depending on the species selections from ESC, you could then, uh, um, the next step is, is the model calculating the leaf area index of that particular species, and that fits into the ammonia abatement graph, which uh, Philippa shows you. Uh, and currently, we've got uh, a, another a DEFRA project with, on natural capital, and we are, we are doing a air pollution model there, and we're expanding on this, uh, this uh, model at the moment. This is what we've done it only for young trees, for 15 years old, or 10 years old, basically, shelter belts. But now we are using the National Forest Inventory Database, which is uh, of 15,000 points across the UK, to calculate uh, above-ground tree parameters, including leaf area index, for different ages, for different tree species, for different mixtures, and make a lot of scenarios for these tools. So, <laughs> that would be an average from taken from that uh, countrywide uh, data. Do that an average for 
species? Yes. Yeah, we started with oak and sitka because we had a lot of data from it because we could even have on a... That would be spatially modelled, yes. But, uh, yeah, it will be not, not that certain for species which are not as present. And we got less database. But for oak to start with and some other species uh, like sitka spruce, we could use them as a model for conifer and broadleaf uh, to, to start the, the tool and the modeling approach like that. But yeah, there's, there's lots coming along. And I, I'd like to hear that you said this index. Is there some pro other project you mentioned about index? Or? Uh, no, it's just that. So I work for SSM Council and I work for the Shape Planting Project. And we've been trying to make the index more accurate and more accurate and accurate. You could use that model. <laughs> Go there and play with it. And if you have any questions, <laughs> yes, send it to us. and. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Really good question. Okay. I'll get, I'm going to hand over now to David um, to tell us about <laughs> why why trees are good for farm business. Thank you, you Philip. <clears throat> I'm going to have to have glasses to read the screen and not to talk to you, so it's going to be complicated. Sorry. Uh, Dave Brass, a uh, farmer from Cumbria. Uh, I'm the wellies in the room, I guess, and unashamedly hug trees and bunnies. Didn't when we started, we've started planting trees. Uh, we have about 150,000 free range chickens on our own farm, about 30,000 organic free range. Uh, but we also uh, set up and just kind of grown a, a, um, an egg marketing company that has 80 other farmers now that supply us in, all with 25% of their ranges planted with trees. Uh, so we, we know a bit about trees and chickens, I guess, and there's no downsides. <coughs> it has been a long journey, and I could go through all the reasons why it was a long journey. Um, most of it taken with Paul here as, as a flag advisor years and years ago when we started planting trees, but I'm not going to go through all of them. It's, it's the journey we've got to where we've got to is what really needs to matter. The only thing that wants to mention there for any people who's advisors in this room is farmers ain't foresters. Don't ever think they are, because you'll mess it up. Uh, we did. <coughs> for the first five or six years, Paul and me were bouncing off each other. He understood trees, I understood chickens. We didn't understand the, 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 the group, gulf between them, did we, Paul? Yeah. And then when you roll that out onto farms and getting farms to, fat other farmers to look after trees, they can't, they ain't foresters. They just need somebody to point them in the right direction. It's a very short journey, then they understand, don't they, Paul? Um, <coughs> that's the, one of the downsides. Benefits, they're all there in the list. Primarily, you're improving the welfare of your birds. We didn't do that to start with. We did it as a marketing exercise. But very quickly, we realised there was, there was welfare benefits to what we were doing. Uh, then we did a bit of work with McDonald's actually in the food service, uh, funding some science to show what are the welfare benefits. And it was things like the shade gives, it, it's shade and the birds don't like extremes of, of climate, uh, and shelter from predators from, uh, and all sorts of other stresses that make them all legging it back into the shed at, at every opportunity. So you reduce the stress with an animal as small as a chicken, you get better quality product, more of that product and less of them die. So it's more profitable. So you now have something that is good for your biodiversity, it's good for your image, it's good for your marketing, and the farmers make more money. It, it all works. Um, recently, this list keeps getting added to. Uh, planning and IPPC weren't that much of an issue until recently. All of a sudden they are. Shrops, you can't get planning. Big lumps of the Y Valley, you can't get planning. Wales, you can't get planning. Northern Ireland, you can't get planning for poultry units. Environment Agency hasn't caught up yet, but they will do. Um, this kind of research shows that if you're, you, you're pulled to units, you plant trees down and them can absorb ammonia and carbon dioxide and all sorts of other things. So it actually, they are a good amelioration effects for, for planning um, and starting to be understood. In fact, Environment Agency were part of this research, but it's getting it into legislation as a challenge. Another thing that's just come on recently is the whole net zero carbon offset which, again, we all understand that. The other ones are fair enough. Odor reductions, obviously, they take particulates out. Someone's mentioned particulates to take them out, trees take them out the air. Uh, so you get less, less odor downwind. Screen is an obvious one. Some of my sheds are 250 meters long, big green sheds in the open countryside. Um, trees hide them. The environmental and, and, and ammonia, again, hasn't been really particularly exciting until recently, but all of a sudden it matters. Uh, and so we get involved in that a lot, and that's a lot of work there. Uh, another thing that <coughs> they do is biodiversity is worth money. <coughs> Excuse me. Didn't used to be, and with government uh, changing the mid nitrogen mitigation legislation last week, it might not be again. But biodiversity could be sold as for nitrogen mitigation to developers, uh, and that work that work was done with the Woodland Trust, showing that the biodiversity and Paul Paul did the actual work on the ground, and they talked about it later. And biodiversity improves when you get to plant trees. The biomass is something we haven't really done an awful about until just recently. We've planted probably 250,000 trees across the company. 
um, of those a proportion of 25 years old and 40 feet high, so we, we, we thin them for biomass. And that's part of the circular economy that big retailers in the UK and, and, and food service industries <coughs> want to grasp that from, from their farmers. You, you plant the trees for bird welfare with your chickens, so it improves your chickens' welfare. You chop the thinnings down, you put them through the chip and go into the biomass. I have two 200 kilowatt boilers that uh, work 18 hour days, flat out, seven days a week. And we keep them entirely fueled by the wood chip that comes off uh, 50 hectares of deciduous woodland. It's, they grow in, in, as Elena was saying, they grow really well to trees in that sort of uh, environment. So it's, that's, that's a significant improvement. That's probably 40,000 quid's worth of biochip that, we, we, that cost us 5,000 to produce as an offshoot from our tree plantings. <coughs> that last one is a kind of obvious one. You, that, that, that one grows on you. I've kind of talked about the cash benefits of it and all the other benefits that come with it, but actually there's a business case for it. You get um, reduction in seconds because you get better quality eggs due to less illness in your birds, reduction in mortality, reduction in farm seconds. That's a little bit anecdotal because a lot of farmers sell their farm seconds for, at the door, so it's difficult to, to scientifically work out on a research project how they but at a minimum of 3% in produ production there. So basically on a 16,000 bird unit, you get 10,000 quid a year better off just on your, your production. Uh, and it costs you half that to, to plant the things in the first place. There's no other investment that gets its return on capital in, in six months. Well, not that I know of any other, sol other than solar panels, perhaps. Um, there are a few issues, of course there are. I've deliberately made the printing on this slide small because the issues are small. <laughs> <coughs> Industry lack of knowledge was a problem. We've spent 25 years working on that, uh, along with people like this and, and Woodland Trust and others. Um, Personal lack of knowledge, we just discussed that one Paul and me bouncing off each other trying to get things right for chickens. We've kind of got past that. And, and, we, and with our own farmer producers, we, we very much try to educate them as we go along on how to look after the trees and how's the best, most beneficial way to do that. Um, one of the key ones that probably was an issue was if, someone, if it's underdrained, heavy land, you get some farmers that say, I don't want to block my drains with tree roots. There's ways around that. You can plant trees with sh uh, silver birch and things like that with a shallow rooting, um, or between the, between the drains with trees that don't have a widespread rooting. So it can, it can be, be fit. And landlords sometimes as well were, were, had issues because you're reducing the uh, value of your land. Uh, but that's getting less. Certainly in Scotland, it's disappeared uh, as forestry land becomes almost as, as valuable as, as, as arable land now. And what I can say is that when you start doing it, attitudes change. A uh, bit of work we did with Paul and the Woodland Trust uh, 10 years ago, Paul, was, as he went around on his annual visit to all these farms that he does for us, um, was asked to ask a few questions. One of, them, one of them was, would you plant trees? Any more trees? And he asked 62 people that question. Two of them said yes, and 60 said no. Surprised me. I saw a surprised face down there. Surprised me too. He asked the same question 10 years later, when these things weren't this high in a tube and causing work, would you plant more trees? It was exactly the opposite. 60 farmers said yes and two said no. So it just shows that they grow on you. And I think the benefits of them grow on you as well. Philippa discussed on the ideal for ammonia planting plan. This is my bit diagrammatical, but I, ideal pl planting plan for a pr practical farm. The orange thing on the far, on the far left is the chicken shed with a prevailing wind left to right. The whole De light green area is tree planted with deciduous woodland, suitable to the areas planted in. Uh, planted in rows around the sheds, you can see the arcs, that's the rows of trees, two, two metres apart in the, in the rows, four metres apart between the rows, four or five metres, something like that. The dark green blobs are the uh, backstop that Philip uh, mentioned. In most countryside areas around in, in England, the last thing you need is a whole stack of pine trees planted in, in so all these backstops planted around out of pine trees, around these ammonia uh, plantings, look like pine forest, not what you want. So we actually put the blobs in, in within the, the um, first 70 meters. So those are woodland, uh, larch, they're, they're Scots pine. Um, so you get the year round greenery, but it's hidden in among all the deciduous trees so you don't see it, so it doesn't look like a pine woodland. Then beyond the 70 metres, on the far side, on this side of them, where the sunshines are, that's what's ideal for your biodiversity. So that's part, that's 50% uh, uh, sunlight, 50% glade shade, so that the, the, the chickens love that, and that's absolutely peak maximised benefit for your biodiversity. Paul gets really excited about the moths and things in that. And that's what it looks like in practice. We stood in this sunny bit, looking back towards the chicken shed. So as you look back through the trees, eventually you can't see the chicken shed at all. And that planting's around about 15 years old. Um, 
deciduous, even deciduous trees on grade three agricultural land with high nutritional levels on it grow really fast. It's not like you're planting them on rural land. And if you can't sell high standard, high quality, welfare friendly eggs from a view like that, you need to give up, frankly. <laughs> uh, a few other takeaways, really. It's just, and, and aside from that, this, the research that we did showed there was improved welfare. Um, the RSPCA assured, which 95% of egg producers in the UK are part of, well, free range egg producers are, um, accepted that as being sensible. So it's part of the um, code of practice now, so that, that sort of engages the whole of the UK free range industry which has meant that we're 26 million better off without knowing about it because of the, the better cash benefits and is responsible for planting one and a half million trees. I've been working with Paul for 25, over 25 years now, so I'd like to thank, for, thank him because that's been a, a symbiotic relationship when we got the first things ironed out, Paul, isn't it? Yeah. And for the last 10 years, people like the Woodland Trust, CEH, um, a lot of the research on ammonia, and then Philip at, at uh, Catchment Sensitive Farming, um, are all contributing to the, the science based to prove the science behind what we're actually doing. So that's me and my farming bit. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just follow on from that. I'll talk a little bit about um, the biodiversity benefits. So there weren't primary objectives of the planting schemes, but a fantastic spin off, a fringe benefit, if you like. Um, and also talk a bit about the practicalities. You know, we David and I sort of formulated the scheme. Like I said, I didn't know about hens and he didn't know about trees, but between us we've learned a lot. My wife's learned, learned a hell of a lot about hens as a result as well, more than she ever anticipated. But uh, it's all interesting stuff, like I say. And it all makes sense to me in, um, in a way. So this is, this is kind of a flagship one. That was one. Uh, and we talk, David talked about attitudes there. That farmer's one textbook that he saw the trees as part of his farm infrastructure, you know, as much as the packing station, the hens, the ventilation, because he knew there were benefits of the, what the sort of work they had done with David beforehand. So that's, you know, he's really looked after and he's reaped the benefits now. Um, so I'll just, um, like I say, I'll explain about how we sort of came up with the idea. So. David's objective was canopy cover for hens, really, reduce the stress, you know, predators flying over, whatever, and, and, and on a day like today, you know, sun, sunstroke, I guess, sun tanning, yeah. And, uh, but it had to be a manageable system as well. The, the more manageable your planting plan is, your planting scheme is, the more likely that management's likely to be undertaken. So we were looking for something that was workable on a, a hen range, so a fairly, fairly unique design. So over, over the years, we, we planted in clumps and things like that, but really for practical purposes, because one of the key things on, on hen ranges is that you can manage the grassland, that's for biosecurity and the worm counts and things like that. So we wanted something that the farmers could relate to, if you like, in terms of conventional grassland management. So we came up with the idea of rows, rows of trees, um, over 20%, 25%, and sometimes more of the range, but we're looking for that minimum. So two and a half metres, so conventional distance space in between the trees, but a slightly wider space in between the rows, so that could be managed, could be topped or whatever. Fast-growing hybrid trees, because we did want an early canopy cover, wanted you know canopy cover as soon as possible after the, the, the new ranges were established, invariably on fairly improved agricultural land, wasn't it? So it's actually quite a good starting point, really, for tree planting including conifer trees for winter cover and latterly kind of serendipitously for ammonia capture and you know sort of diffusing ammonia plumes and things but this is where my environment my conservation interest i did a master's in native woodland ecology really enjoyed that and, and like the sort of dynamics of native woodland so i said well let's try and incorporate or, or use a model that's based on locally native woodland types around particularly around the ranges, you know, up in uh, Cumbria, I would say upland mixed ash woodland. That's a bit unfortunate because we can't plant ash now, but we ex exchange that with sessile oak and things, but inherently a sort of native woodland type of mix. Now, it's not like a woodland because it's linear and things like that, but what it is in the end, you, you, you change the structure of the grassland as, and as well as the tree cover, is a lot of woodland edge. And uh, as we... And we go around sort of helping year, year on year, if you like, particularly after, you know, the first few years after planting to um, 
make sure the farmers are, are looking after the trees, help them get over those early frustrations, if you like, and I'll go into those a little bit in, shortly, but the idea is to sort of have something workable that reflects that sort of native Ludwig and Titans relieved to that the broadleaf trees actually have a benefit as well. So that, that was borne out. Uh, it's a good guess. That. <laughs> um, so as from doing our annual visits, I, sort of, I don't, I sort of, it's like a, a, an advisory visit rather than a policing visit to make sure the farmers have put their, you know, they're looking after these trees because they are an important part of the production system. We, um, we were lucky, we talked to the Woodland Trust and they, they very kindly agreed to sort of fund a study, a sort of four-year study, actually five, but what first year was a part of it, to look at what biodiversity we're getting. These, you know, imagine a, a greenfield site like this with a hen shed, and then we plant a, a, a native woodland mix within that, certainly in that sort of composition. And how does that biodiversity change over time? It's just curiosity, but it was really a fascinating thing to, uh, to have a chance to look at. It's a, a real sort of benefit and really enjoyable part of the job instead of just filling forms in all the time. So uh, we did it because David's long-term commitment to tree planting, we had a good cross-section of sites, new sites, sites that were just starting to establish and ones that had been around for a while and, and the trees were very much part of that, you know, established part of that uh, local landscape. So uh, we've had three sets of three sites. We looked at bird sort of interest. A friend of mine, ex-FWAG uh, colleague, did three surveys over the year. Bats, we did like a passive um, bat survey overnight um, on each of the ranges each year for four years. Butterflies, we did transects. They're all conventional sort of or slightly adapted survey techniques, but then moths was light trapping with a mercury vapour light in this case. And we also wanted to look at ground structure, so was, I devised a sort of way of assessing that because it's fairly unique. You've got mown sections and then between the trees, tussocky sections, so I wanted to see how that may influence, and then obviously developing canopy cover as well. So over those four years, so if you think bird species, about 59 species um, of birds within these range, which from, like say, a few years ago were greenfield sites, fairly uniform monocultures, to be honest, and 12 of those were on red lists. A song thrush, imagine the sort of ideal habitat, the sort of grassland mixing with the um, wood trees. And bats, um, from the survey, they, we were getting bats every, on every range, whatever age it was, as soon as you plant trees, that was attracting them. But interestingly, as the trees develop, the bats weren't just commuting. They were, they were there all night, so they were clearly using those foraging sites. And then butterflies. Now, I was 14 species. That's not particularly high, but bear in mind, hens, they look quite benevolent, but they're fairly ruthless if there's anything like a butterfly knocking about. And also, we were looking at how we could establish sort of pollen and nectar mixes, but... <coughs> They hens love that as well, so it's, we're still working on that. The grassland sward mix, that's the thing we need to do next. But, um, like I say, 102 moth species, and that was one night each year on each site. I reckon you could probably extrapolate that if you did it a full season survey, maybe once every month, three or four fold, I'm sure, because they, they, um, they, there was a good range. And that was some grassland type moth, you know, where, the, where they, um, their hosts are, are grassland grasses. But it clearly a lot that would also associate with trees and woodland, you know, shrubs and things like that as well. So that transition was there, and it was the management of vegetation. You've know, got that structure, structural variation in, in comparison to sort of um, ordinary grassland, like say improved grassland, and canopy cover. Now, as time goes by, even at four metre spacings, you do get sort of coalesce, coalesce canopies. So we were looking at perhaps longer term to open that up again because the best diversity, the, the best mix was kind of in the intermediate, late intermediate stage um, plantings, if you like. So practical considerations, clear objectives, and they're kind of mobile objectives, but we knew what we wanted to do at the start and we've stuck with that and, it, and adapted it you know, to include things like ammonia capture and things like that as well. Aftercare is absolutely critical. Um, Persuading farmers to plant trees is one challenge, getting them to look after them so they don't get, they and we don't get frustrated with them as the other one. Um, 
Like I say, I'll, I'll allude to that. And then longer term management. These things change over time, so it's not a case of like it wouldn't fit and forget. It's a thing we want to still keep that dappled light and, and stuff. And working on farmer attitudes, which is is good if you it, it's beneficial if you, if you work hard at it and, and and bring them along with you really, isn't it? I think that's the thing. You know, we haven't just said plant trees and you're on your own. So and the, we've three R's, if you like, of aftercare. We do an assessment, a range assessment on the planting and give them a summary of what they should be doing each, you know, to sort of re remedial work. So um, first one is replace mortalities because we want that canopy cover, you know, particularly around the hen shed. Um, restake, there's often a lot, especially if they've put livestock in, which is a nightmare, knocked over. So we basically want it to look as good at the end of the second, the third and fourth year as it does after they've planted them. And then removing... The, the um, tree tubes particularly as well. These grow like mushrooms, really, the trees on, on these sites. So we, uh, you know, we encourage them that. So we tend to walk around with the farmer and point these out and say, you know, their approach is, so I encourage them to do little and often, not to have to go in and spend two weeks solid doing this, but as they're working around the range of a winter sort of thing, to try and make it a more manageable uh, task. And then the, the sort of... Um, this is the farmer attitude. This is the things that they felt were challenging and why maybe they weren't as successful or, or they needed that extra work and labour. And particularly over time, the, the ranges tend to be getting bigger, the units are getting bigger and perhaps moving more towards getting contractors in to do the work because of the sheer scale of them. But that labour is an important consideration. Livestock, I would say ban it for at least five to ten years because they see when you fence it off, make the range, there's a lot of grass and it there's an sort of compelled to graze that and they put a few sheep in and that can lead to a month's work replanting trees and things. And then just site, we work in Cumbria, so we're very, quite an altitude range down on the coast and things, so really got to make sure that the trees can fit into that. We've had some challenges on the coast and things, but uh, you've got to have, sort of look at each kind of bespoke scheme for each one. But David mentioned farmer attitudes before, and so he was right. The first time we did a, a straw poll, I'm basically asking every farmer what they thought when you, when you, they were after planting and then going around beating up if the the um, and general remedial work it's a bit of a disincentive but as time goes by if you if you, if you help them through that sort of period when these trees get up and they're quite pleasant and when I was doing the biodiversity survey I was often there late at night so the farmer was out shooting hens in, and really pleasant atmosphere, you know, the sort of like orchards or, or glades and things, and that's when you see this attitude here where, yeah, trees, pleased to have them on the farm, definitely. And, the, and, this, and they see, like, if, you know, if, if this is the weather we're getting, that, that shelter and shade's probably going to be increasingly important, really, for things. But, so this is my sort of takeaways, ongoing advice, practical advice that they can relate to, um, and don't assume, like say, that, that farmers know it's not another crop, it's quite a different, there's a lot more uh, subtleties in terms of the care and things. But that those, you know, if you can encourage them over that hurdle, then they'll, they'll reap the benefits, and so we all will, really. Um, and, and it's a case of sticking with them as well. We would certainly go out every year for the first two or three years, you know, till we can see they're getting established. and. Go, back, go out the first year to check what's, if they've done what they're supposed to do in terms of planting and what might sort of need some beating up, whatever, and then go back and just make sure they're, they're still there. And like I say, it's, it's an advisory visit, not a policing one. That's, that's the thing about keeping them on board. If contractors are doing it, make sure that they have an aftercare sort of agreement as part of it so that we, we will get that sort of canopy cover that we're looking for. And then ongoing advice, it's often a phone call or something like that. And... It's kind of building up a relationship, isn't it? With you know, you have your producer groups and things like that. So it's being there because I think that's that's probably one of the biggest um, drawbacks at the moment. There just isn't necessarily you know, when I worked for FWAG, there was sort of points of various points of contact locally, and I think this is one way it sort of shows that that's still value. Um, so that's kind of it, really. But uh, fantastic project, career highlight for me because so uniquely mutually beneficial commercially and environmentally Brilliant. thank you, thank you.
got a few more slides to talk about pharma support that's available. And we, we did a survey as well um, as part of the ammonia reduction from trees project. And we asked farmers, what benefits would you expect to see from planting on your farm? Um, and you can see the biggest thing that came out is wildlife and environmental stuff. They really understood that they got that. They weren't so sure about farm business benefits, but some of them did identify them, particularly poultry sector has started to see the business benefits. Um, and when we said what would motivate you to plant tree shelter belts or woodland on your farm, um, kind of loud and clear grants, funding, financial incentives, also some support and advice and assistance as well, and that practical advice that, that um, Paul has been talking about. Um, it's interesting um, to, to hear about yeah, how the attitudes change once they got experience of planting trees. We also found that with, and once we'd done the experiments with, uh, done the farm trials with the farmers in Cumbria, and they had some guidance from Bill Bailey from UKCH on what was happening on their farms and how, um, and he ran through the ammonia calculator with them. They were much more positive about tree planting than before they knew what they were doing and what the benefits were. So, yeah, in terms of woodland creation, some of you will know this already, but one of the things that we, we managed to do as a result of gathering enough evidence, really, on um, trees being effective for um, capturing ammonia is to introduce um, a new description within the countryside stewardship for tree planting, which allows trees to be planted for um, tree shelter belts for ammonia capture, um, and then we link to the guidance there. And you can get some advice from catchment sensitive farming on that, and um, it requires CSF approval to make sure it's designed in a way that will be effective. Um, also managed to get that into the England Woodland Creation Offer, slightly late, so we ha didn't get the kind of stackable extra bonus payments for air quality that you've got for water quality and floods, but you can actually use UK, with, and it's got really high rates of payments for designing tree shelter belts for ammonia as well. Um, um, also, there's other um, grants for planning as well, and there's all sorts of, as we know, as we know lots of new opportunities for green finance and funding trees as well which are coming up so it might be something that will be there in the future maybe with carbon credits or nutrient mitigation possibly if that goes ahead um, or um, private funding. Um, Woodland Trust also offer these schemes um, so trees, trees for your farm for, uh, for agroforestry and more woods and more hedges so more woods I think has been used for, um, for tree shelter belts as well so yeah you can ask them and all these um forestry commission csf woodland trust and others can provide advice on tree planting um or, or how to use trees for in our case at catchment sensor farming we're aiming at improving water quality and air quality and reducing flood risk um, and we work with the tree action plan delivery team in natural england to work out um, where the sensitive area areas might be that you might not want to plant trees and we also offer broader advice on farm practices um, and farm infrastructure changes that you can make for those benefits um, so if you're interested in having a look and playing with those tools that i was describing and designing a tree shelter but from only capture i've got a few um, clinic sessions offered in the woodland trust gazebo tomorrow um, if not, have a look at our tools, and there's a summary of the research trials on, on, the, on your chairs there. But really the key messages hopefully you can take home to today are that trees can deliver for farm business and for environmental benefits. They improve um, air quality and biodiversity. The larger, the, uh, the leafier the tree and the deeper a tree shelter belt, the more effective it will be at capturing ammonia. Clean air is good for humans and nature. Um, and farmers are more likely to adopt tree planting if they understand it or experience it. And, and there's lots of advice and guidance and grant support out there um, available, so make use of that. And thank you for listening, and thanks very much for all the speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got about 15 minutes if there's any more questions. Okay, hey, thanks. There's a microphone coming down. Um, one question I'd like to just ask. What's the uh, 
planning authorities, what's their views on this one? Um, obviously, you involved the EA, um, so I'm just wondering what uh, Natural England and uh, the local planning authorities, are they sort of on board with this, or are they... There is, any... that, is that a bit of an ongoing challenge? I think it's, a, um, it's an ongoing challenge, probably. They're starting to recognise it, but they're not, um, it's difficult to get it accepted as a mitigation um, for a new poultry house, for example, and in our experience, because of the time lag. So it would take 10, 15 years before the trees will start capturing that ammonia. So they, they look on it favourably as an additional kind of um, proposal that will maybe help with the planning permission to get through, but that what they want to see is concrete mitigating measures to reduce ammonia emissions from the farm. Um, that they'll need that as a condition for planning um, to, to, to show that you can reduce the overall ammonia levels if, if there's a sensitive area that is affecting nearby um, first, uh, as well as the tree shelter belts. Um, but we're hoping that as people get to know more about it, it might become more accepted. And it's the same with the, the Environment Agency. It's not really part of permitting at the moment, for example. And for example, those ridge fans, um, ridge vents in, in, the, in the broiler shed, uh, one of their medication measures that they suggest to blast it out and dilute it, but that, doesn't, that just kind of moves the problem on and um, it doesn't really, uh, it's not really helping if you want to um, capture ammonia either, it makes it more difficult actually. So I think there's a bit of um, learning and spreading the word on this one. Can I say anybody? Can, yes, please do. No, basically, <laughs> <laughs> a mile behind. <laughs> and planners just referred to EA, and EA just aren't there. But to be fair to the EA, they, I didn't speak loud enough. <laughs> um, they haven't got any way of changing best available technique. We're left Brexit. We're left Europe. Europe controlled best available technique. The best available technique is still to the EA, blast the ammonia as high as into the air as you can and give it to other people. And there's no way of changing that. So until they do, planners will just say, follow best available technique. The EA will just say, follow best available technique. And that is not what this research shows. So it needs intense lobbying from everybody in the room with parliamentarians to say, change the regulations. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, just um, to say congratulations, because it's a fantastic just seeing the way you've worked together from you know farmer level research you know everybody together it's it's just a fantastic example of the way things should be done to make things happen on the ground um also i suppose the one question was elena your research was really interesting i know whenever the ceh changed the model from the alpha to the beta we have been playing around with it a little in northern ireland with like a 30 meter shelf you know um backstop on shelter belt we were getting like a 30 percent 25 30 percent reduction in ammonia and then when he changed over to those at the alpha or the beta model that reduced to six so with your research with the five farms and the one in shropshire will that be integrated to try and improve those figures to make it more attractive for farmers you know and even for the planners to say oh here well this is a big percentage mitigation you know or reduction yeah, that's, that's the aim um, to do, to constantly improve with more data as you come in and more specific data on three species, on the mixtures, and uh, yeah, to be more precise. But yeah, we, yeah we're constantly um, improving, and especially this year, by December, there will be much more improvement in the model because we are feeding, as we speak, the model with a vast diversity of data on trees. Um, uh, spacing, tree species, tree mixtures, and aging, because this is what we, you know, we were modeling before the leaf area index with age, but now we could actually, you know, use measured data um, from the National Forest Inventory, which is amazing opportunity. Paul, Paul, there's a lot of biodegradable tree guards out there. Have you had any experience with using any of those with the, the, the ranges, the chickens, and which works best? Not yet. No, we haven't really. Um, they generally use the certainly 0.9 tubes because hens can do quite high, but that's something with all the planting plans I'm involved in looking away of because there's a worry there's going to be a heck of a lot of plastic left. Not so much on hen ranges because that's a kind of more close quarters management, but the biggest games elsewhere, isn't it? That's going to be an issue. So. 
talking to, I work a lot with the Woodland Trust and they're looking at that. Maybe even bear, more higher density bear planting and accepting that you're going to get losses, but overall it'll be maybe more manageable that way. Hi. You know, for the areas where you want to have the moths, butterflies and pollinators, could you not just have little circles of exclusion zones with chicken wire? Potentially, but I'd really like something, to try and keep it practical, something that the farmers can relate to. If, if, if we did that, my worry is that the chicken wire would get trashed and the hens would get in and they would have a field day sort of thing. But it's looking, you know, I'm interested in doing a lot of work with farmers on like herbal lay type things or certainly more diverse grassland swords and maybe that's the next step at least because there's, there's quite a bit of grassland as well as the trees so it's an opportunity anyways to explore certainly. You've got, at commercial farm level you've got to keep it simple. If you have things like that it works fine but when somebody's driving down the road with the topper to get the grass down they don't see it and just blow over it. Um, <coughs> I kind of think we kind of learn of experience to keep it as simple as you possibly can. I guess with the some, some of the ranges are they're sort of rotate, they're rotated, aren't they? They're sort of almost like a paddock system. So there's an opportunity there, like a, a longer rest period. I'm doing a lot of work on regenerative farming with farmers. So that, that long rest period seems to reap benefits for well, soil health as well and, and biodiversity. So that's w work in progress, definitely. Yeah. What we've had in 25 years is never a year when it's been the same. <laughs> It's always, it always develops, it always changes, it's, it's a living plan really. Mm -hmm. The last seven years have been ammonia, yeah. but there's always something else comes into there. It's kind of fun. Yes, it is. <laughs> On that herbal lay idea and um, any trees that you plant, are you looking to try and substitute that for any of the chicken feed that you use? Somebody asked me that earlier on today. Um, you've got to be awful careful using trees as, as sources. We, we have some crab apple and, and some hens will, will eat the apple. But you've got to remember is that chickens are egg-laying machines. Genetically, they're the most advanced farm animal there is. You shove food in there, egg comes out the other end. Uh, it, and most, it, it's ideal to maybe balance up an amino acid uh, level or uh, slight protein anomalies, perhaps put a high level of, of, of an intense protein in there. But as a general feed, volume feed, you don't want to do that because you dilute it too much the standard corn ration that they, wheat ration that they eat and soil. So it's, it, there's possibilities, but you do have to be careful. We plant a lot of uh, willow, and if you work with hens, you, you very quickly work out that they're the stupidest animal on the farm in some ways. And what, one particular flock, after planted willow, was 15% of the planting for 20 years, one particular flock on one particular farm decided it wanted to eat willow. The whole flock was decided it wanted to eat willow. Every willow in the place was stripped leaves. Willow is high in oxalic acid, aspirin, effectively. Um, so that's why farmers used to feed it years ago to the sheep, because it was, it was a good painkiller. Um, but it's an acid, and it burned all the tongues and all the guts, and they started dying on piece because they took, just decided they wanted to eat. <laughs> Never seen it again since, but so you have to be careful. So I was just thinking with the uh, production in soil that we can use in animal feed, trying to substitute for that protein source. Uh, we're looking at that. We've reduced our scope three carbon by about 70% just by changing feed, but that's more North American soy, reducing the soy in the diet, substituting with, uh, uh, probably you substituting with, with sunflower. A lot of sunflower comes from the same South American countries. Um, we put in a little bit of beans. Beans have wrong balance of amino acids, so it's difficult to do it, but you can. But there's no reason why not to. Insects, probably not a source. The waste streams that they say is the magical answer for insects actually aren't waste streams. You know, such as Morrison's, they feed all their bakery waste to uh, the black soldier fly larvae to suck for protein, protein for the hens, but actually the, the, that bakery waste was going to pigs beforehand, so it wasn't waste really. Mm. So there's a bit of smoke and mirrors and greenwashing mm. and all sorts of stuff in that, so you have to be careful again how you, how you interpret that. But yeah, there's options, but it probably won't come from trees. I thought I missed my chance there. It's a really simple question for you, I think, but my brain is... I'm too hot to work out the maths. Is two and a half metres by four metres 1,100 stems per hectare? Right. Because yeah. you said 1,100 stems per hectare, and you were saying two and a half metres by four metres, and I was like, is that the same? It is. There we are. That's good. Maths works out. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> OK.
I think everybody's <laughs> hot and tired and yeah. flagging. I'm definitely flagging. So, yeah, just thanks again, everybody, for coming along and hearing about it. And big thanks to Paul, David, and Elena for talking today. It's been really interesting hearing you. And I, I pick something up new every time, which is great. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry.